Western Jamaica campus and our host, Custos Dr. David Stair, Dr. Nicole Plummer, our guest lecturer, Chair of our Academic Coordinators Committee, Dr. Alpha Obika, members of staff, students, and guests, good evening. A warm welcome to a truly extraordinary evening as we gather here at the UE Western Jamaica to celebrate the conversions of Black History and Reggae Month through our esteemed Black My Story Monday lecture series. And boy, do we really need this warm welcome tonight. Tonight is not merely a commemoration, but a vibrant exploration of history, culture, and the powerful influence of women who have for, for far too long remain unsung heroes. For well over a decade, the Western Jamaica campus has been a beacon of intellectual discourse, hosting public lectures that illuminate the invaluable contributions of individuals who, has, who have shaped the tapestry of Jamaica, the region, and the world. After a pause, we, have we are elated to revive this tradition with an added layer of significance this year, an early celebration of International Women's Day under the theme, Inspiration, Inclusion. I am particularly thrilled to announce that the driving force behind tonight's lecture series, well, the start of the lecture series, Dr. Prendigas has Dr. Prendigas has diligently curated a program that places women at the forefront. This strategic de decision is a nod to the vibrant connection between these lectures, the West, 
and or esteemed institution, the UIMONA. The university has, a long, has long been a pioneer standing at the forefront of championing the imperative to celebrate and recognize black history as well as the cultural and socioeconomic impact of reggae on the Jamaican community. The UA's commitment to black excellence has reverberated not only throughout the region, but across the globe. Our institution has been instrumental in nurturing outstanding everyday leaders, as we will hear about soon from Dr. Plummer, who have transcended boundaries, becoming true revolutionaries in their respective fields and industries. Their everyday contributions impact an impact extends far beyond the Caribbean community, their homes and their homes, leaving an indelible mark on the world stage. Our distinguished speakers for the series, Dr. Nicole Plummer from the Caribbean Institute, from the Caribbean Studies Institute at Mona, and Dr. Kisha McPherson from the Department of Professional Communications at the Toronto Metropolitan University will grace us with insights into recent and ongoing studies. Their focus will illuminate the seemingly subtle yet revolutionary ways in which women continue to shape contemporary history and contribute to the dyna dynamic landscape of the media and communication of today. As this evening's lecture unfolds with a compelling delivery titled Everyday Revolutionaries, Women and Change in Jamaica's History and Culture. The narrative that will be explored transcends the spotlight on well-known historical figures like Nanny, Sam Sharp, Paul Bogle, and Nanny Grigg. Instead, it will delve into the overlooked, often overlooked individuals whose small acts of rebellion and deviation from normative patterns have paved the way for significant change. It is an exploration of extraordinary within the ordinary, where everyday revolutionaries, <clears throat> particularly women, were experiencing some turbulent weather for colleagues. So let me begin again. And we're in a semi-open space for those online, so hence the pause. It is an extraordinary exploration of it is an exploration of the extraordinary within the ordinary, where everyday revolutionaries, particularly women, play a critical role in reshaping our understanding of history. The lecture places particular focus on women and takes the view that each individual through their small acts that deviate from normative patterns of injustice and equality in an is an everyday revolutionary. As we embark on this intellectual journey, may the narrative shared tonight inspire us to appreciate the subtleties of revolution and the powerful impact that each individual can make, no matter their small contribution. And if this weather permits me, I would love to introduce our guest speaker tonight. She is, of course, no stranger to the West. As mentioned before, she's Dr. Nicole Plummer, a lecturer in the Institute of Caribbean Studies at the Faculty of Humanities and Education at the Mona campus. She teaches several undergraduate and graduate courses in cultural studies with her PhD in history. Her work bridges the past, the present, and her work bridges the past and the present and is reflected in her research scope. Her, cur her current research areas connect Jamaican history and popular culture, food, heritage, and culture, climate justice and wellness, and Jamaican folk folk culture and mythology. Help me give a warm, warm welcome, she will need it, to Dr. Nicole Plummer. Thank you, Indiro. You know, um, 
I'd like to see the weather today as just indicative of ancestral blessings. And that's what I want to start with. So, the weather, notwithstanding, the blessings, notwithstanding, I want to start by just wishing everyone a wonderful evening. And uh, I want to just issue a special welcome to our specially invited guests, to our students joining us face-to-face uh, -face and online. You could be anywhere at all in this cold front, and you're right here listening to me. And I hope that something will warm in the pit of your belly after I have finished speaking. So it's a pleasure to stand before you this evening. The University of the West Indies, Mona, Western Jamaica campus, holds a very special place in my heart. I never come to the West and don't stop by. I can't come to the West and don't stop here. And I'm grateful that in this very challenging time, I see so many familiar faces before me today. Now my talk today is entitled, Everyday Revolutionaries, Women and Change in Jamaica's History and Culture. I, like many other pe persons here with us today, I like stories. And this evening, I am starting with three stories. One story in the conventional sense of the word, one a poem that calls to mind a personal history, and the other a personal reflection story. Now the first story, let me see if I, if I get this right. I move it like this, okay. How do I move the, um, the, do I, what do I point at? Okay, so, so the first story is entitled, the woman in labor aboard a slave ship trading, aboard a ship trading in captive Africans, the 23rd of, of, of October. Last night, the black wench bore her child. One of the watch heard a caterwauling from the woman's place and sent to Mr. Kensel, who descended and found her in labor. He informed Mr. Collingwood and the master, wanting no doubt to preserve the women, she being the mo amongst the sturdiest and hence most saleable aboard, and mindful also that a thriving infant, that a thriving infant would have a certain small value in the islands, went below taking his surgeon's tool. I accompanied him to hold a lanthorn. The linguist followed with a second lanthorn. The woman's cries pierced through the blackness. I raised my lanthorn. I saw her then, knees high and spread apart, two women pinioning her arms to the mizzen mass, two more holding down her ankles. Others stood silently around them. Here, said the master, trying to push through, stand aside. At hearing his command, the women looked up, and their eyes gleamed white and moist in the lanterns. Great-grandmother was a guinea woman. Great-grandmother was a guinea woman. Wide eyes turning the corners of her face could see behind her. Her cheeks dusted with a fine taken into Bakra's household and covered with his name. They forbade great-grandmother's guinea woman presence. They washed away her scent of cinnamon and scallions, controlled the child's antelope walk, and called her uprisings rebellions. But, great-grandmother, I see your features 
blood dark appearing in the children of each new breeding. The high yellow brown is darkening down. Listen, children, it's great grandmother's turn. Now the final story I want to tell you is about my grandmother, Zilla Aline. Now I was born long after Zilla Aline died. And great grandmother Zilla's life was interesting. A petite woman and a snazzy dresser, Zilla Mela left Jamaica and worked in Panama, where she met and fell in love with Richard Aline and had five children before being left a widow at 36. She spoke fluent Spanish, and I was told that she was a peaceful woman abhorred any kind of conflict, kind, considerate, and gentle, a woman who felt things deeply, it seemed. But I found out that she, like me, was an undercover rebel. Going through a trunk, going through a trunk in the old house as a child one summer, I came across some pamphlets and pins, lovingly preserved, on women's equality and the right to vote. My peaceful grandma believed in women's equality and based on other documents I located, was a member of a faction of the women's suffrage movement in Jamaica. In her Bible, okay. all right, give me a second everyone. All right, so we're having a very um, interesting evening. Now, before I continue, I just want to share a little story. The lady who I'm telling you about, Zilla Aline Nene Melo, her, on the day that um, they had her funeral, it rained just like this. So I'd like to think, right, that at least so the family history goes, I'd like to think that she's here with me in spirit and is encouraging me on to tell her story. So let me continue. So my, I'm going to just start that section over in case you missed anything. So going through a trunk in the old house, as a child one summer, I came across some pamphlets and pins lovingly preserved on women's equality and the right to vote. My peaceful great-grandma believed in women's equality, and based on other documents I located, 
was a member of the faction of the women's suffragette movement in Jamaica. In her Bible, I found a dedication service celebrating Jamaican independence. The order of service was dated August 5, 1962. So, on top of being a suffragist, she was a nationalist. And uh, supported Jamaica's anti-colonial movement. She was also independent. And from her relation, our friend, Mrs. Jesse Isaacs, Nee Davidson, she inherited 10 acres of land. A land that nurtured me growing up. Land that I hiked up and down and explored in detail. Granny Zilla, it seemed, was a historian in her own right. She had a family Bible and in it kept meticulous records of births, marriages, deaths. And who departed Lethe to learn trade, to go to England or the United States. While she may have started this practice, my grandma certainly continued it and made several entries, later entries, in her careful handwriting. Perhaps it was no accident that I was drawn to studying history. She also preserved sayings important to her in her Bible. The first line of her notes read, But the one lasting thing in man is character. This echoes a sentiment my grandfather drilled into me growing up. You bring nothing to the grave, Nikki, but your character. Another version he taught me was, you own nothing but your character. Other writings she had stated, love the old if you are young, help the weak if you are strong, keep a guard upon your tongue, own a fault if you are wrong. Without ever reading these words until April 23rd, 2021, when I discovered them, I realize I've always lived these words. So the values of this ancestor of mine, of Zilla Aline, lived on, passed on by grandpa to me. That we can be everyday heroes. And importantly, I wanted to tell of the ways that women have been able to play pivotal roles that change the course of history. We're not taking anything from the heroes who headline our history, such as Nanny of the Maroon, Nanny Grig of Barbados, of Taki, Sam Sharp, Paul Bogle, Marcus Garvey, and others. They are the faces of revolutions, but revolutions happen because of the people behind the scenes. Revolutions have catalysts too. Some slow, boiling for a number of years, some inspirations passing on through generations of stories told by grandmothers combing the hair of granddaughters, by mothers and daughters cooking together, of private histories made public. The three stories I told demonstrate the resilience, bravery, courage, and strength of character possessed by these individuals in ways that were ordinary. Through their ordinary roles as mothers, midwives, grandmothers, friends, they effected change. What do I mean today by everyday revolutionaries? I am speaking to individuals whose actions have made positive changes, who have bucked against traditions and practices that support inequality, actions that have not always made them popular, but actions that were purposeful and change-oriented. In essence, their activities, behaviors, and practices pushed against dominant discourses, paving the way for revolutions and new discourses. Our three stories demonstrate some important ways in which women have been everyday revolutionaries, and I want to untangle some of these. The first is women as cultural curators. I cannot help but to start here. I am a historian by training, and this training has influenced my work in cultural studies. Women, through their roles, play an important role in connecting us to our past. The first story highlights the significance of cultural retentions in birthing practices, and of course, the militancy of women standing up for the vulnerable. Sasha Turner writes that retaining control over childbirth gave enslaved women access to informal power. In their roles as midwives, women maintained traditions that connected the distance between Africa and the Caribbean. 
However, this would change as hospital births became more pronounced and undermined traditional birthing practices. In other ways, women acted as everyday heroes. We all have to eat to survive. I don't think I know anyone who is able to live without food and water. Now, I'm part of a research group, Caribbean Foods for Climate Justice, that seeks to use traditional foods to restore the balance that has been toppled by climate change, climate disaster, and neoliberal food policies that see the younger generation favoring and valuing fast food over traditional foods. I wrote and now teach a course called Food and Culture in the Caribbean. One of the themes we discuss is food and memory. Students are invited to talk about their experiences with food. For most, the memories involve celebrations with families and being taught to make Christmas cake by mothers, aunts, and grandmothers. They remembered food cooked by the women of their family during holiday and family gatherings. They recall the joy and the love that food brought them. Curry goat, oxtail and beans, roast chicken, escovitch fish, rice and peas, gungo peas and rice, baked macaroni and cheese. I'm making myself hungry here. Sorrel, sweet potato pudding, and so forth. However, food was not only something that was consumed for celebrations. Many remembered mothers, grandmothers, or aunts cooking their favorite dishes when they were sick or sad. Food was a vehicle for love, of love. But food also connects us across continents and is also a story of triumph. On the plantations, the enslaved were relegated to eating foods that were not fit for the master's table the tail, the head, the feet, and intestines of slaughtered animals for protein. Salt fish and flour were imported for their consumption, both often spoiled on arrival. This was supplemented by what the enslaved obtained from their, provisional, from their provision grounds, marginal estate, not used to plant sugar. Plantains, ground provisions such as yam and edos, Peas and beans were planted and supplemented the enslaved diet. Enslaved women took these humble provisions and made with them some of our favorite dishes today. Roast yam and corn, ackee and salt fish, rice and peas, oxtail, cow skin and, or cow foot and beans, chicken foot soup, fried dumpling, and I could go on. Now, they passed on this knowledge of herbs and spices through the generation to us. None of these foods were palatable without these herbs and spices. Now, food is an important signifier of self and cultural identity. Candish Gusha therefore argues that food sustained the cultural identities of those enslaved and exploited. Food was an important theater for social relations. While the slave master meant to treat us as less than human by what, they, by what they served to us, our ancestors took the plant as refuse and made it palatable to human beings. They preserved their humanity against the atrocity of plantation life and the colonial system and food. Food, that basic element, was one of the ways in which they did so. Women not only played a significant role in cooking, but in food preservation, production, and distribution. In these roles, they asserted the humanity of the individual of color against colonial practices to the contrary. In the story of rice, for example, Judith Carney and Richard Rosamoff established the centrality of women in rice dispersal in the Americas. In attributing rice beginnings to their ancestors, maroon legends reveal the ways in which the enslaved gave meaning to the traumatic experiences of their own past while remembering the role of rice in helping them resist bondage and survive as fugitives from plantation societies. These oral histories offer a counter-narrative 
to the way transoceanic seed transfers are discussed in Colombian exchange accounts. They substitute the usual agents of global seed dispersal, that is the white navigators colonial were the ones largely responsible for the kitchen garden and animals such as chicken and pigs around the yard space. Items from the provision grounds and even the kitchen gardens were sold in markets. Today, markets such as Charles Gordon Market in Montego Bay, Coronation Market in Kingston, and the various markets across the island remain major distributors of food. Food is sold by informal traders we have come to call higlers. These traders are found throughout the African diaspora in places such as Haiti, where they are known as Madame Sarah. They wield not inconsequential power. My grandmother's grandmother and mother both sold at Charles Gordon Market. From her income, my great-grandmother was able to support her daughter's dream to become a teacher. There are many stories like that at the U University of the West Indies, Mona, of informal traders supporting their children's dreams for higher education, doing so without formal loans, but instead through informal community-based survival practices such as throwing partner. These are the stories that bucked expectations, that have their genesis in the dreams ambitions and hopes of the black working class classes. By supporting the dreams of their children, these informal traders pushed against dominant discourses that relegated people of African descent to poverty and instability. Victoria Durante Gonzalez, in her article, The Occupation of Higlering, closes on this poignant note. Higlering provides women with a sense of independence. This notion of a sense of independence was revealed through many conversations with Higglers. My hostess and I had many discussions about Higglering. And during these discussions, she repeatedly gave this as one explanation for her continuing in this occupation. You are a woman, and I am a woman. You have a hobby, and I have a hobby. But we must always remember that if your hobby gives you a 10 cents, you find a way of making 10 cents of your own. I grew up with women in my family always finding a way to making that 10 cents. I'm certain that many of us can relate to this sentiment. Now, how many of us have seen memes that have Caribbean mothers and grandmothers providing mint tea or ginger tea to cure every ailment? I'm sure we've seen the memes. Well, for my great-grandmother, Roetta Perkins, that tea was Cersei tea. She swore by it, drank it every single day of her life, and that was a very long life. She died just shy of her 100th birthday. Cause of death, old age. But knowledge and use of hers was important to mothering practices in the Caribbean. I remember when I had my daughter and, produ and struggled to produce enough milk. I had women telling me about fever grass, tea, fenugreek seeds, and a whole heap of other bushes and herbs to get the milk to come down, they said. Now, Caribbean people have always looked at Western medicine with some amount of skepticism, feeling perhaps that that kind of medicine was not created with them in mind, and the recent research has definitely demonstrated this gap. No, Rastas say, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food, and it is not far from the truth. What we use to season our food also has healing practices. Shadow bene, as it is known in the Eastern Caribbean, or spirit weed in Jamaica, is known for having a wide array of health benefits. But shadow bene, right, is very, very important. I mean, my students in Belize, my students in Trinidad and Tobago, right? Shadow Benny. In fact, they tell me, when, Miss, when you go on a hike and you see Shadow Benny, Miss, please pick the Shadow Benny for me. 
and I promised them that I will look out for the shadow Benny. Now, garlic and thyme also have benefits. I use leaf of life on multiple occasions to dry up my daughter's mucosal production during colds. Knowledge of how many leaves is critical, as well as how to activate the anti-mucosal properties. Salt, that is how you activate it. Candy Scooter underscores this crucial point when she writes, women control the critical knowledge about what was safe and what was unsafe, what could cure or kill. The most basic food preparation became symbolic code for separation of realms. In this way, women, through their knowledge of herbs and spices and cultural transmission of knowledge, forge important bulwarks against ill health. They keep alive crucial knowledge that connects the past and the present and remind us that indigenous medicines have merit, especially in this day and age of, our, of perilous financial um, situations. Now, today, there are several women who are using holistic medicines to help women suffering from fibroids and endometriosis. This knowledge they, they receive not only through study, but also through their ancestors. Women are important functionaries in Caribbean traditional healing practices, even as mother, mothers, for those of you who are uninitiated in the Jamaican language, and spiritualists of the revival church. We are everyday revolutionaries through the stories and the proverbs we choose to tell. Clifford Gertz argues that culture is simply the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Thistlewood tells of Vine, an enslaved woman who told Anansi's stories to pass the time. On Sunday the 17th, he recorded, Mr. Vine, Mr. Says Vine told many diverting Nancy stories this evening. At my house, she tells them very cleverly. At night, Vine and Abba told Nancy stories. That's on the 21st, Wednesday the 21st. And Nancy's stories, as you know, are subversive tales that see the small, quick-witted Nancy often outwitting his often larger foes. And Nancy tales provided the enslaved Africans, old and young, with the blueprint to, sur to survive enslavement. One advantage of Anansi tales was that they could be told right in front of the planter class without them having any ideas that these tales taught their pr property how to resist enslavement. Proverbs such as one one cocoa full basket illustrate ways that those with humble resources have to survive. Stories and proverbs maintain class and cultural identity and provide us with the skills necessary to survive in circumstances not always conducive to that. Dress has always provided us with an avenue to express our individuality and affirm our humanity. In my story of my great grandma Zillow, I told you how she was a snazzy dresser and how that has passed down to my child who sees herself as a very snazzy dresser too. Dress is not innocuous, particularly in contexts where some cultures are promoted over others. Steve Buckridge therefore writes that dress was a visually accessed language of the body in that the way one dressed was constantly scrutinized and itself provided a narrative, especially in the absence of a shared spoken language, culture, or religion. If distinctly Eurocentric dress tacitly supported the planter class, then Afrocentric dress that reaffirmed connections to Africa formed a silent and effective mode of resistance. During celebrations, women of African descent were known to wear a profusion of beads and gold ornaments. Hairstyles consisted of plaits and corn ro cane rows. Elaborate and simple head ties connected women across the African diaspora. Buckridge does state that the head wrap or the tie head represented the continuity of African heritage in dress and served as a symbol of resistance. Head wraps also serve to pass on key messages. Head wraps are also important pieces of fashion in Afrocentric religions such as Revival, Santeria, Orisha. Religious head wraps are quite different from those worn daily. Finally, I want to highlight the non-titular roles that women played in armed confrontations. I end on this note 
Because while our everyday heroes keep alive the flame of revolution through ordinary acts, the fact is that the cup eventually overflows. In the context of re rebellions and revolutions that had figureheads, women played very important roles. Vereen Shepherd in her work has demonstrated the role that women played in the Sam Sharp War of 1831. Women provided fighters with water, guided them towards provisions, acted as lookouts, watched captives, and acted as messengers between different factions. In discussing the Morant Bay Rebellion, the work of Swithin Wilmot, Clinton Hutton, and Gad Human highlight the role of women in protests and indicate that they had a more central, though not titular, role to play. According to Wilmot, although there's no evidence that women occupied any of the formal positions as captain in Bogle's regiment or indeed participated in the drilling that preceded the march to Morant Bay, women were part of Paul Bogle's organizational network in the Blue Mountain Valley area of St. Thomas in the East. Wilmot goes on to show that women occupied informal networks, such as using their homes as bases for Baptist meeting, boosting the morale of men, and they also use the Marat Bay Rebellion to get even with some of their antagonizers. Moreover, to, women, to Wilmot, they were not just nameless faces, but included persons such as Sarah Johnson, Caroline Grant, and Elizabeth Taylor. Houghton also had a similar stance when he argued that although women played a leading role in the upheaval in St. Thomas in the East and might be credited for casting the first missile in the war at the Bay, the politics of the black masses in post-slavery society in general and in Paul Bogle's movement in particular was dominated by men. Women were not allowed to drill, take oath of allegiance to the movement. They had to walk on the side. There is no known female captain or secretary of the movement, although on several occasions during the conflict, women demonstrated that they had a final say as to whether a perceived enemy lived or died. Women showed deep resolve to fight at Morant Bay. Forging the cauldrons of colonialism, racism, capitalism, and many other isms that sought to dehumanize them, Caribbean women, Notably, black women had to consciously and unconsciously create ideologies that liberated them even momentarily. While women certainly participated in public ways, through their everyday actions, they affirmed their right and the rights of others like them to dignity, humanity, and self-determination. We have all benefited from these women, most nameless in history who have instilled in us these traits to help us uh, overcome adversity. If in our everyday lives we also epitomize their values, resilience, courage, self-respect, self-autonomy, creativity, then we can feel proud because our ancestors lived through us. Thank you for listening, everyone. Dr. Plummer, I thoroughly enjoyed the lecture. And you know, I don't believe it's because of my own love of history, culture, and nature. But I believe it's the approach you took, storytelling, that art, the original methodology, actually, for learning. Um, we, I enjoyed it. And I'm sure our audience here and online enjoyed it. And you did that so well. We learned about Grandma Zilla. Can I tell you, I too have a similar cabinet chest, you know. And um, colleagues, audience, go on, go, go on and look in your great grandmother and your grandmother's cabinet. You will find something in there, you know. Your little pieces of paper, um, you know, ju just birth certificate, pictures where applicable, and even jewelry, you might find something. You know, Nicole, you mentioned seriously, and ironically, I went home to my country on the weekend. And you know, one of the reasons I wanted the Cirrus Bush, because, you know, it's so important these days. We are now relearning what our 
cultural traditions were in food. And unfortunately, I would say the second generation of my family never really learned that because I was quarreling with my uncles and my mothers. So say, you know, when I grew up, my granny would have the syrupy tea. She would have all the fruits and vegetables. I would go around and, you know, picking those fruits, those herbs, and I would have been able to use them. But Nicole, unfortunately, we have lost some of those things. And I, I highlight that because I, it, it resonated with me and it is so important to see and understand and learn how the women, our grandmothers, our great grandmothers maintain and kept those cultural um, knowledge and has brought to us and have helped us to impact on a wider sense, not in a wider way. And we heard about, you know, the folklore stories, head wraps, women in wartime, my, my, women the unsung heroes who have impacted our lives. Now, that's my summation of the lecture and how much it has you know, further titillated my understanding and my curiosities to continue my own research. Now, the floor is open and we're open to Q&A, but I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and ask Dr. Plummer a question. Dr. Plummer, you spoke so highly and most importantly on Grandma Zilla. You did speak a little, but I'd like to hear some more on how she has impacted you now and, has, and is impacting your daughter. Um, so you may come to the lectern to answer me and then you're going to stay here and the audience will then ask questions to make it easier. And colleagues online, the weather has calmed a little, well, a lot. We hope it remains that way. Thank you, Indira. I, I remember hearing about um, Zilla Ali you know, as a child. I, never, I was never blessed to meet her. But I heard about how quiet she was, how she, nice she dressed. I uh, heard how nurturing she was. And uh, I was a very curious child, so yes, I went digging through things, through trunks. And at the time, I, I didn't realize the significance of what it is that she was preserved from her. And I think a lot of times, uh, and what is sad is that in the Caribbean space, we're not really trained from a young age to recognize the value of these items as cultural artifacts. What I found was a woman that carefully preserved things. And I remember growing up and uh, wondering about certain things about myself. And uh, when I, I saw how uh, I went into the bi family Bible and I saw how she kind of recorded things and all the little sayings that she does. And I, I tend to do that. My Bible is filled with all kinds of lists and writings. And uh, she wasn't a woman that was given to anger and rising um, and, and loudness. And my grandfather wasn't. But I remember one day talking to my grandfather. And he said very soberly that you can't carry anything to the grave in a Nikki. The only thing that you have after you, before you, is your character. Right? Because everything can be taken from you. You... This day you have a lot of money, tomorrow you don't have any. But the one thing that you have, when you have a lot of money or you have no money, whether you have a job or you don't have no job, whether you live, whether you die, is your character. And Grandpa always drilled that into me, and he was very always concerned that he, he mustn't be hearing anything about me on the road that he didn't like. And when he went to my school, I went to Montego Bay High School, and Grandpa went to parent-teachers um, parent meeting, and he went from one teacher to the next, and his head got bigger and bigger. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Grandpa had a way of carrying himself with like a bounty, bounty step, and he himself was a snazzy dresser. He, he had to look neat when he came out. And that's me. I like neatness, right? I'm always, I like to be neat. But... On a more serious note, 
I've always thought about my character that if uh, someone, uh, if, you street, if you sweep the streets and if you're the president in a building, the person who street the, sweep the streets should not say that I treat you any different than the person uh, who is president. And I'd like to think that that came from grandpa. And grandpa got that through my great grandmother. And uh, that was who he was. He was a man that um, everyone respected. And I, I like to think sometimes, as I go through my everyday life, I think about who these people are and what they stood for. And that I'm living in a way that is conducive to that. Now, unfortunately, I do have a temper. So I can't say that um, I'm always peaceful, but I'm mostly peaceful. And incidentally, my daughter kind of have the temper too, but she dresses very nice, and I am trying to instill character in her too. Hello, nice, good evening. Thank you, Nicole, uh, Dr. Plummer, for the very engaging and very informative uh, presentation. I learned quite a lot from you. So two questions that I have. One is, uh, what in your opinion needs to be done to bring greater uh, prominence to the role that women have played? It really does, the story needs to be told. Um, this lecture is a major part of that, but what do you think needs to be done on a more sustainable level? That's one. And two, uh, I, I do know that you're involved in the, it's a Caribbean food. Yeah, Caribbean foods for ca climate justice. Right, could Research you tell food. me a little bit more about that? Because I suspect that that's probably part of, part of uh, you know, the, the bring into light the role that women have played? If, if not, probably you could tell me your own research. Maybe you do have some area of research that you're exploring to, to bring, you know, to highlight the role that women have played. All right, so let me take your first question. What can we do? It's, uh, it's, it's a loaded question. And I, I say loaded because the change would have to come on uh, different, um, at different levels, right? And I would have to start with women themselves, right? <coughs> we, have to there, we have to place value on what it is that we do. And uh, I wouldn't necessarily just say women because there are increasingly a number of men who play those roles, right? As caregivers, as the persons who are combing their daughters here and telling them stories as there are more and more and we need to put value not necessarily just on the gender, but on those activities. Because when I, when I teach my course, um, Caribbean Food and Culture, my students, and they talk about Christmas, they don't remember the presents. They, they don't really talk about the presents. They talk about the food and the time that people spent and, and how valuable that is. And we have to move away from valuing the material to valuing the time and I think when you start to value the time and the things that you do with that time then you begin to value what was what previously we took for granted when we take away when when we ourselves are removed from that nurturing environment of when I feel sick all I can think about is Grandpa would rub me down and grandma would make tea and ain't nobody here to make me no tea and rub me down that way. And I get miserable and spoiled thinking about it. But that's what we miss, not, the, not them buying us anything. So there has to be a revaluing, but this revaluing comes uh, from we ourselves, but it comes from what we, yeah, I know you're media-based too, so you know I'm going to do that. What we support in the media, but it also comes down to, and in cultural studies, we do look at the, the role of, um, my brain 
of, of ministries of culture, ministry of education, of cultural policy and educational policy and how these come to bear, right? We don't really have, uh, we have young people learning subjects, right? But maybe we have to also start focusing a little bit more attention on learning about themselves. And I think once you learn about yourself, you learn to value the, the invaluable. That's what I'd like to see it. So I hope I've answered that question because there's no, the thing with culture is that it's organic. But sometimes org or, um, anything organic requires a catalyst. So the question is who will be that catalyst? No, as it relates to my research group, we are, it's Caribbean Foods for Climate Justice. We have done, uh, I must say, some amazing work. We're made up of researchers from the UK and from the Caribbean. So we're looking at the University of Edinburgh. Um, one of my colleagues shifted university and I forget the exact name of it right now. But if you search online Caribbean Foods for Climate Justice, you will find our website. We were involved in two research, um, two major research projects. The first one is, was recipes for resilience. And what we tried to do was to connect uh, youth uh, to their an to ancestral foods, right? And, uh, and ancestral food heritage. We did it through sensory techniques like music, song. We tried to um, spur their memories. We used storytelling. And one of the things we wanted young people to share with us was how they felt about the changing environment, how they felt about food culture, what they felt is lost. And out of this came um, a song you know, that basically looked at how the world was shifting, how we have shifted um, traditional foods to fast foods and uh, looking at some of the solutions and the thoughts. And the fact of the, the, what it reveals is that our Caribbean youth have strong feelings about their future, about their environment, about where we're going, about the decisions that some of our, from our more recent and current people have taken. And uh, the second research that we're still doing right now is that, uh, is, uh, ancestral foods and we've connected with the Jamaica Taino and Hummingbird Maroon, Maroon group and uh, the work of Kasikiani Ronalda Pierman. She is very much involved in sharing Taino food heritage with um, the world and looking uh, at food as uh, not just as, as something you consume but food as uh, medicine. Right, and in fact, she goes to, she speaks quite often at a lot of um, schools and places. And uh, what we did was that we also connected with the Jamaica 4-H, 4-H um, club. And uh, you have individuals like Sylvia Mitchell, um, Pat Northover, Thera Edwards, Charmaine McKenzie, myself, Marissa Wilson, um, Ina Yaniva Thoraman, um, Kate Crowley, Anthony Richards, Reggie Burke, um, Caribbean uh, Youth Environment Network, um, and I could go on. But our work, what we do is that we also have, um, we also connect with individuals in Barbados, Antigua, Trinidad and Tobago, um, Suriname, Belize, Guyana, Jamaica, clearly. <laughs> Right, and we also worked with um, the Song Academy UK and the Black Open University. So, what we so going back to the second project now, we it was the four, Jamaica National 4-H Club, Jamaica Hummingbird Taino Group, and we're collaborating in creating an ancestral cookbook to kind of remind people of some of the traditional um, dishes, traditional meals, how they can be prepared, how they are, um, uh, you know, what you can pair them with and uh, so on. And we also did an ancestral gardens tour, which uh, also demonstrates some of the ancestral gardens amongst indigenous groups in other Caribbean territories. So that's, uh, that's, those are, that's the kind of work that we're involved with. And 
I'm looking forward to taking the work in um, other directions because there are some ideas that I want to um, and some research techniques I've been toying around with in my head. So, yeah. Um, I, I know we're strapped for time. <laughs> but um, when we're having this conversation, Dr. Plummer, about, you know, the kind of focus you want for the, <laughs> for the <coughs> lecture series, um, I, I, I remember you, you know, you're saying, okay, yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting way to look at it. And earlier in your presentation, I can't remember the exact statement you made, but the one that really stood out for me had to do with revolutions being made not just by the persons up front, but by those behind the scenes. And uh, later on, you talked about, you know, Wilmot and the others saying that though you may not have been able to identify women as captains and as it was it was clear that you had significant uh, contributions from women in terms of you know making sure that there was in fact success uh, and and and, and as I, I think you know to connect to, to Dr. Obika's earlier question about what are some of the ways in which we can actually you know make bring forth this kind of valuing as you as you have called it um, of that role, not just to value those who are up front, but to also recognize that, that those who are behind the scenes are as important to the success of any kind of change, of any kind, whether it be you know, uh, radically revolutionary or just subtly um, happening within the culture itself, as you would have pointed out with the food. And I really, I just want to say I appreciate um, the presentation and I and I and I, I, I you know I know that Indira is going to do the vote of thanks, but I, I, I just want to be just want to say thank you very much for helping us to bring some kind of thought and public um, engagement around that kind of revaluing that we need to do, not only as a society but certainly as a university around the, the, that, that the role, the significant contribution that those um, in the, you know, behind the scenes do play in advancing our history and culture. I just want to thank you for that statement, Dr. Prendergast, and to just really say, I don't think any institution can stand without the people behind the scenes, right? Um, the people whose names we don't always remember. But the fact of the matter is, I like to think of myself, right, as one of the persons behind the scenes. And to think that my role is as important as the faces in front, right? We are only as good as the people we stand on, the shoulders that we stand on, living and dead. Nicole, what powerful words to end on. We are only as strong as the people we stand on. And that, that speaks volume, especially within our university. Actually, in every organization, I would like to think, as you said. Dr. Plummer, it's my job, everyone, to give the vote of thanks. So I want to start, first and foremost, with our guest lecturer. Dr. Plummer, thank you so very much for coming to give us such an enlightening and impactful lecture. And I'm sure that we have all taken away nuggets and we will think about them, ruminate on them and carry on in our own individual ways, how to think about and execute on how we can become unsung heroes in our everyday life, our families, our work, our colleagues, our friends. So thank you very much for that. I want to thank Dr. Prendergast for his leadership and vision in putting together this Black My Story lecture series. As always, it always explores great and interesting theme that somehow finds its way into making us all think about something that is at the forefront or sometimes things we forget. And we always find a way to make it impactful. And of course, we can't forget the people who we stand on. I would like to thank our IT team, Andre Hewitt, Nikaela Robinson, and Matthew,
for helping us to set up for our event. Of course, our facilities team, we could not have been in this lovely space without them. I want to extend thanks to Carla Edwards and Mrs. Crystal Stennett for your support of our campus director. And I want to thank you, our audience, for coming out and sharing with us. Thank you for journeying with us on this lecture that became so empowering and inspiring. And, of course, see you on Monday, February 19th, for our next lecture in the series. Have a good evening, everyone, before the next round of the storm comes, the next pin. Good evening. <laughs>